All right. Oh, wants me to update. Skip it. Yeah, I was still grading um, stairs this morning, um, stairs and shadows and all those kinds of things, and oh, it reminded me of a bunch of stuff. Anyway, uh, just to kind of continue and maybe kind of in the same order, um, yesterday I kind of did like a two-point perspective, right? Um, kind of dialing that in, going over, you know, F10 and some of the abilities that does. Um, so obviously I didn't want to rob you of the one point, so, and relatively it's, it's kind of the same thing. Um, but, you know, there are some options. I'm going to take what I need, just press copy, and do another piece. Um, as I was mentioning actually to a student uh, yesterday, uh, you can always draw yourself a rectangle. Sometimes it's really helpful to kind of organize also your drawing, because um, if you zoom out a little bit quickly, it becomes a very unorganized mess. Um, so again, the hide tool is, is really popular. Um, and then, of course, using just layers to, to kind of segregate things. I'm a big fan of just putting boxes around them, and that kind of helps me understand where I'm at. And arguably, even my stuff is already disorganized. One thing I forgot to mention as well, because I was explaining it yesterday, this seaplane, this grid with the red line and the, the green line, that's called your seaplane, right? And, or sometimes referred to as your world plane. This can be moved, honestly, anywhere you want. Right, and it, it's really just to signify zero, 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 zero in the X, uh, Y, Z uh, coordinate system. So uh, just keep in mind, right? You can really build anything anywhere, but it's kind of a center point. And if you ever accidentally do this, of course, just kind of highlight the whole screen and press your zoom select and you'll get everything, of course, back into view. Um, not sure if I actually went over that, so uh, just wanted to kind of show it just in case you're absolutely lost in your digital space. So obviously I want to go over one points today as well as um, the two point perspective and the one point perspective and how to create those from your finished 3D model, right? So if you happen to get to it this weekend and get a lot of progress done on your 3D model or a lot of drawing, obviously you could take the 2D right into Illustrator and you're starting to, you know, good to go. Um, or you're starting to make your 2D lines with your 3D model. So. Just like last time, I'm going to select the layer that I want. In my case, maybe it's a construction line, so I'm going to stick with that. Uh, maybe first things first, I should actually uh, rotate. Um, however, you might be in a situation where, I mean, don't get me wrong, that's a pretty easy rotation. We could just use that as our center point, use this point, and lock it up. Another thing that's pretty nice is a line, right? So you can, of course, use a line, and that's basically to align something. Right, and basically selecting two lines to align it. Um, you can also orient, right? So I just wanted to throw some things out there that, you know, just in case rotate's not working for you, you know, you can always use um, different tools and different commands. So let's keep drawing this. Perspective plane starts to be pretty important for the one point perspective. As you guys know, maybe just as a recap, uh, the perspective plane is the only spot of the object that is true size, right? So just keep that in mind, guys. If, if your perspective plane is in the middle of the object, it's going to both project back and project forward. Just like in the one-point perspective, if I put this towards the front, only the front of the object will be true, right? Just like if I put it in the back, I'm going to have to project towards me. Anyway, I just want to recap on some of those exact same rules of the analog, right? So again, maybe just kind of a recap in that regard. Um, but in my case, I'm going to put it at the top and I'm going to project. Um, actually, I'd rather go the other way around. It gets a little bit bigger that way. Otherwise, it's going to get really, really small. Obviously, I'm going to use that as my back plane. And then I'm going to, of course, project out because, well, all of this stuff is outside of the bound. I'm going to need a stationary point. And you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go non-center today just to kind of see what happens. I mean, why not? Uh, I'm gonna maybe stand a little bit closer to the object and a little off-center just to kind of see what happens. 
I'm gonna go ahead and get some of my elements. So take that one across. Obviously I'm just doing a simple box. So maybe I should do something a little bit more noticeable. Let's go ahead and draw something real quick. Actually, you know what? It's even easier. Offset, six inches. All right, we got some walls going. Oh yeah, purple comes in pretty good there. I'm gonna go ahead and explode those. Turns it into four separate lines. Sweet, don't even need that one. And I'm gonna go ahead and extend those two lines. Like I said, eventually this comes like the back of your hand. Right? So at least we have a cool wall situation, and I don't know, in floor plan, I'll, I guess I'll put like uh, almost like a door situation like we had last time. And we'll sort of put it off center as well. So I'll copy it and click anywhere, type in 36 inches, enter. Of course, hold shift. And I can get that, that sort of door going on. I could even take it a step further and poche this thing. Just so we can all see. I always accidentally press poche. And as you can see, it looks like I don't have closed lines. Not really sure where. It's pretty sure those are closed. Anyway, we can select boundary mode and actually just select ourselves. Ah, uh, that's more appropriate. Obviously we want that hole in there so we can see it in our one point perspective. And I'll go ahead and leave it magenta just cause eh, it's a nice color. So that's looking pretty good. We got our stationary point. Now we can start calculating some things out. So just like the other one, we're gonna get that back element first. And <laughs> again, I think the computer just honestly makes it so much easier. You can copy lines, you know. And I'm definitely a big fan of, once I've copied the line, I'm, I'm always looking for ways to like, you know, have I already drawn this? Even though it would have been simpler for me to just draw another line, it would have took me five seconds. Um, I have t a terrible habit of <laughs> going around myself. Um, you may have realized that you kind of do that too, like um, you almost look for the easiest way. I, I think that's pretty natural. But So we've got our lines, we've got our back figure. Obviously we need a horizontal line, so let's go ahead and draw one of those. I'm going to draw it uh, fairly towards the bottom of the object so it kind of projects up a little bit. And again, if you need a helpful reminder, you could always make a text box right, and say horizon. Right. I mean, there's a lot you could do here to make it diagrammatic even. And again, just kind of remind yourself, keep in mind guys, this might be something that um, you might not use until maybe you transfer again. And they ask you to do two point perspectives and you're like, oh man, what was that? Yeah, I mean, maybe you remember my YouTube or something, but if you have your own file, that would be enough to, to of course help you out too. Um, and I'm definitely a, a hoarder of digital files. You know, some people hoard stuff in real life. I hoard digital stuff, right? Like books and pictures and, you know, all these different things. And let's face it, I love it because when the internet is out, I still have a lot of stuff. Anyway, um, let's continue. So, got to get our stationary point. And we need to get our vanishing point. Now, in our case, it's going to be directly from this guy. Oh, gonna need to have our points unlocked because I do want to make sure that I get that exact point. And I'm just gonna go straight back. Not a big deal. It's also gonna give us, you know, I could just make a copy. Arguably, I think, you know, the two point perspective is actually easier. Oh, it's not locking onto it. What can I do? Obviously, I can hit perpendicular because I do want a perpendicular situation. And it's even going to pop up and say, oh, that's perpendicular, right? Now, in my case, I'm going to make a line. Obviously, I know what's kind of going to happen in the one-point perspective. So just to kind of start to draw things. Not too bad. Obviously, it's going to be square, and it's going to get probably pretty big so I'm gonna just go ahead and draw that square and then offset it at a distance you know that at least makes sense I don't know 10 feet maybe that's too big yeah maybe that's too big and this is just so I can extend the lines all fairly easily so if I offset it 
and let's go with what five feet uh, probably more than that well instead of just doing it more and more just delete one I mean why not okay. obviously it's gonna be projecting out at us so we we do want some of that of course I don't want to do all the work so I'm gonna type extend and just extend these lines because why do more work in fact yeah the computer didn't even know which way to go on that one so let's accidentally get rid of that before I confuse myself sweet but yeah it, it's not gonna line up perfectly to this box but again the box is just so that you can extend those lines a little bit easier right we can start to build this this one point perspective so continuing on uh, as you guys know we need that one diagonal point and to be fair it's, it's honestly kind of arbitrary. There, there is a way perfectly to calculate it based on your focal angle and yada yada yada. However, that's really not the objective of what we're doing. So I'm just gonna go ahead and make a point that I know will make sense. You know, it's about three times the object. I'm gonna go ahead and make a copy. Take that diagonal point, and again, put it to my horizon line. Perpendicular, sweet, you gotta love that feature. Of course, I'm going to draw my line so that I can make my diagonal point. Obviously, it's going to go to the bottom corner, right? And then it's going to extend out for a really long time. So I'm going to just use my desk. I'll go ahead and do that. That's looking pretty good. Oh, didn't work. There we go. So yeah, um, pretty small object, right? I mean, we got a pretty intense diagonal triangle there. Not a big deal. So one of the next things that uh, honestly is one of my favorite tools for sure is being able to divide a line up into as many segments as I want. So remember how we used the grid for those segments and you kind of already had a grid, right? So the, the way to make a grid is of course in my case, I just want one line. So I'm gonna explode those four. Now I've got all these separate lines, but now I can type divide, right? Which is really nice. When I type in divide, it's actually gonna give me the number of segments, right? So keep in mind, if you're trying to get the number of points, you want a minus one. So in my case, it doesn't really matter what I choose here because I'm just making a grid system. I'm gonna go 10, right? And as you can see, it's gonna make up a bunch of little points for me to where I can just draw a line for each of them, right? And of course, establish my grid, or arguably, I could just take it and copy it, right? Why work harder when we can work smarter? You can just take that exact grid, of course put it in the spot that I want it, and go from there. Now, I can't think of honestly a, a special way to do this next part. Obviously, at the end of the day, some of these things you just gotta, just gotta click the lines. So we'll take those. This is probably gonna be one of the, the last drawings, however, just because, well, it's gonna require a little bit more knowing how your object is working, right? Uh, more than likely, it's probably gonna be from outside of your observation tower, sort of looking into a certain window or situation. Another way that we can go about using this one point perspective is we could use hidden lines as well to kind of show off what's on the inside and sort of show a faux situation where we can see through walls where, you know, that, that stuff doesn't really happen in real life, but of course in a digital realm or when we're trying to communicate something, absolutely. Okay. And we'll get all those grids. That's where it kind of gets tricky. I mean, if you zoom into the situation, usually uh, I messed up, right? And as you can see, it's not exactly detrimental to the drawing. In fact, it might just be a nice human error. So some of those human errors that we think we put in are just kind of naturally there as well. So let's get some of these, let's get that one, those three, that one, and that one. And as you can see, we're starting to get that lower plane, right, of our drawing. And even better, right? Man, I don't even have to draw any new lines today. I'm just gonna copy that one. I'm gonna take the intersection point that's already there. And boy, oh boy, look at that. Just intersections for days. May have gone a little too far for this object. As you can see, my grid is very squished. And 
and so on and so forth. Looks like we got one there too. As you can see, it's pretty condensed, right? So how would we change that? Well, I could take this point in, right? I would need to trim it first. Because, I mean, instead of doing the whole drawing again, I mean, why would we do that? Well, we can simply just move the line. Arguably, I could take this point and take it out. Right? Of course, now it's not going to align with... Oh, I accidentally deleted it. There it is. Obviously, I would need to move it so that I could find my new point. You usually can just hit M. However, some defaults are a little different. And obviously bring my point a little bit closer. So again, just kind of using some of the laws of geometry to, to figure those things out. Obviously now the only thing that I have to change is really my horizontals. So let's go ahead and get rid of those. Except for one of them, because I'm going to copy it. Or at least move this one first. There's this new location. Okay, looking a little bit more square. Definitely not bad. Definitely getting better. But as you can see, I didn't have to redo the whole drawing. Right? And what's really important about this um, assignment, guys, is just kind of being ready for it, right? Being ready for whatever task is being asked for you. I can't explain that enough. I mean, especially in architecture, um, there was this one time I had to make a house for a doctor and the stuff he was talking about, I was like, man, I gotta go look this up. Like, I don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> and you find yourselves in architecture doing that a lot. Um, and you learn a lot from those situations. But very often we don't design for other architects. We design for um, usually things that aren't architecture, right? Otherwise they wouldn't have hired an architect. Anyway. But yeah, definitely grid looking a lot better, a lot more realistic. And it was of course just because we brought in that diagonal point, right? So hopefully a good refresher, at least in terms of the one point perspective. However, where it's gonna to start to become, I think, important is where you actually show maybe a window or a wall situation. Um, you know, maybe looking inside the building. Another way to look at it is maybe looking outside the building, but also there's nothing to look at. We don't actually have a site or anything like that. So I don't know, maybe later there's an opportunity to put a tree and a cow, you know, way out there. I mean, after all it is Texas. Um, but yeah, that'll conclude for the one point perspective. Obviously, we'll continue the conversation um, probably more one on one basis or case by case, just because all of us have kind of different situations. You know, I'm just thinking of um, Brajan's, uh, you know, it's going to be wild and really have this kind of rhythm everywhere, right? Uh, luckily, he's modeled his, so you won't have a problem, uh, which is the next part that I wanted to talk about. So, taking a model such as, you know, obviously our cheesy one that we made up. Um, I'm going to go ahead and make it a little bit bigger so that we can talk about this a little bit better. So last time I went over how to set up a camera, right? So what's really nice is, you know, just kind of go over that one more time. Um, oh, we have about 30 minutes. Yeah, it's enough time. That's perfect. Uh, when you type in camera, you can show your camera, right? And immediately you start to see that cone of vision and you know, even when you zoom in and zoom out, it's going to change that camera's cone of vision. Um, and it's definitely something fun to kind of play with, to kind of see what, what does what. This is our stationary point for that cone. And as you can see, our stationary point does, does a lot. Um, but this is where we're going to want to come up with our two-point perspective. And as you can see, mine's already kind of locked into that. Um, but I do want to show you that you can, of course, manipulate it even farther than a two-point perspective. However, I don't think there's actually a one-point perspective view, and you may kind of see that immediately. There's isometric views, which is somewhat nice, especially when you're making diagrams, right? You can kind of get that, that perfect view up. Oh, I totally messed it up, so I'll do it again, right? And of course, you can even choose different angles and things like that. But that's usually pretty nice, especially for an isometric. However, there's not really a plan oblique option. Um, because it's not a it's not a real model. It's a it's a projection of something Just just as much as a two-point or one point is a projection as well So let's make this a little bit bigger sweet and Let's continue this model just a little bit that way There's actually something to produce and well, I guess we do have some situations here um, 
Honestly, it's probably fine. But I already said I'd do it, so let's go ahead. We'll take that piece. I guess I don't need those. Sometimes I'll like actually find to where there's nothing behind the model, right? So a situation like that, that way I can actually just highlight it a lot easier. Some of you guys might kind of wonder why I do that or fly around. I just think it's easier, especially if I didn't accidentally um, label and layer all of my stuff, right? Obviously I'm trying to save some time with the tutorial, so it is what it is for today, but I, yeah, I should be grouping things like I did there. But that's pretty sweet. Let's go ahead and make a copy of this, because why would I do all that over again? So let's take those two pieces. And let's group that so I don't do that again. Sweet. Again, it just makes it easier to click on. Right? Let me go ahead and make a copy of that. And kind of just spiral it up. Right? I'm going to kind of push it off to the side so it's a little easier to work with. And as you can see, it's very easy to suddenly go upside down. But yeah, let's get it off into space so I can turn it around. Holding shift and of course putting it back in a nice spot. So in my case, I'm going to move. Arguably, I, I guess I could have took the previous location to get it, but oh well. I'll take that one. We'll just get it on there. And then a move accordingly, obviously to this shape. So I'll go to my top view. Okay. Oh, I got two top views, just in case one breaks down. I'm not sure what I copied there. I guess I don't really need that. Or is that my camera? Oh, that's my camera for my top. That's funny. Because, again, it's a projection. It's not a true perspective view. I'll go ahead and turn that off. Uh, however, what's kind of funny is whatever view is actually enabled your camera will turn on for that view so like if you're not in the per perspective view it won't make your camera for your perspective but technically what you're looking at in your viewport is a camera view so it is kind of interesting how how you can do that you can literally have four sets of eyes at one time can be quite confusing and confusing to explain but let's go ahead and reset this view back to just a regular perspective a little bit more familiar Especially while I line this up. It looks like my camera is seriously in the way. I don't know why I can't turn it up. Hide. There you go. So let's go ahead and move that piece. And a group. And... That's weird. Looks like I have it in the right spot, but I know it's not in the right spot. Oh, is it just this piece? Gotcha. Hold up. Okay, there we go. Get those two pieces and move them across. What? Oh, it's just this piece. Gotcha. So go ahead and move. Yeah, I'll fake it till I make it. But I guess I can get it pretty close and use smart grid to, to really line that up. But as you can see, it immediately jumped down to that line. Not a big deal. Again, I would just use a different view and move accordingly. Of course, if I wasn't just making this up on the spot, I'd probably know where the next landing was and could move it accordingly. Move it to that piece and of course put it there. Looks like I still need to move it, honestly. So I'm just gonna fake it till I make it. But yeah, at least we have a, a decent situation to look at uh, before we try and make 2D. And really for the sake of tutorial, we, we'll just kind of imagine that this is a finished model, right? I mean, let's we got all the parts, we got maybe all the railings, maybe I thought of a roof. Some of you guys are getting into the structural elements of it, which I think is great. You know, make yourself a little I-beam, extrude it, you suddenly have an I-beam, right? So, I mean, there's a lot of stuff you can do here and definitely worth seeing that creativity um, or your skills. Some of you guys have even taken computer graphics already and I'm gonna be expecting a little bit more from you guys, right? Uh, seeing what you of course learned in computer graphics and how you plan to take it a step further. Um, but yeah, let's say we got our view. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and make my two-point perspective. I already made one last time. However, let's make another one just to kind of recap. Like I said, we're gonna need our camera. I'm gonna make sure that I click on the viewport that I want the camera. 
That way when I hit show, it's actually going to show that one, right? I don't know, maybe I want a kind of a, a dramatic one point perspective. I mean, sorry, two point perspective. So I'm going to maybe get a little closer to the object. I'm going to get a little closer to the ground. Obviously in my case it's like focused on nothing, so definitely want to bring that down. What's nice, again, I can choose that center point and really focus in stuff. Bring it way closer to the ground. It's starting to look pretty cool. And again, I can always manipulate it just a little bit more. Yeah, let's get fancy with the spices today. Oh, stuck on two point perspective. That's okay. Let's just choose a regular perspective so that I can actually change my line of my camera a little bit more. I think that's what I was going with. Actually, I want to show you that, that you can use the hidden lines pretty well. So I want to get this side actually. So messed up a little bit. It's okay. But all right, we got a two-point perspective going on. Obviously, we got lines going that way. We got lines going this way. And you'll see that actually within some of your options to that camera, you can change it to a two-point perspective or one-point perspective uh, or even three-point perspective. Um, let me make sure to find that. Make sure it's still in properties. And again, while it's usually only when you have one of these points of the camera enabled. Maybe it's in the set view. Set camera. No, it's not there. I know by default it is at two points, so it's not a big deal, but there used to be an option to quite literally change it, and it was kind of cool. Resolution quality. You can change the background. Of course, you can make it transparent. That's really useful, especially when you're trying to add a sky um, into the background and things like that. Ground plane, obviously you want that on, otherwise it looks like it's floating out in the middle of nowhere. Um, you can make it use a material. We can control the sun. Usually there's something called camera projection, <laughs> but I may have to find it later, at least since we're a little pressed on time. That's okay, it is actually technically already in a two point, so not really a big deal. Uh, but let's say I saved my camera, it's good to go. I'm gonna go ahead and save it. We'll call it number two, press apply. And sweet, you know, that's that's what I'm going with today. So, um, I guess I could hide my camera. Don't really need it in the way. And let's go ahead and make 2D. However, you'll notice the make 2D command, just like I was, I was showing a little bit last time. Um, it can be, it's basically controlled by the viewport as well. So in our case, usually I like to highlight it stuff just because it's easier from the top. Then you have to click on the viewport itself before you make 2D, right? So I'll hit make 2D. Now, as I was saying last time, I always uncheck hidden lines, especially when I know I don't need them because it is a little bit demanding and very confusing of a lot of lines, um, as you can see in a moment. So I'm gonna enable hidden lines because I do wanna see the stairs in the background. And what's really nice about this program is it's even gonna separate it into an, another layer for us. So we don't even have to like do any of the work. Um, so as you will see, we'll go ahead and press apply. And then it's always going to produce its view actually in the, on your top view, usually at the zero, zero point of your drawing, as you can see, where we draw most of our stuff. So actually another good rule of thumb is to not have stuff usually in this center point, because that's where a lot of stuff gets projected. But as you can see, holy cow, in the time that I spent in all that modeling, I really helped myself out here. Right, because I can make 2D and I can instantly make lines for thousands of perspectives, right, arguably. Um, what's also really nice is if I zoom in, it even has all the hidden lines for me, right? So I can easily change that um, and, and do what have you. However, what's not forgiving is it shows every single line that was made, right? So for some of you guys who did those block stairs, it's going to show all of those lines unless you get rid of them before you make 2D. Um, so again, the stuff that we do 
usually comes back at us, right? You know, especially on the next step or once we jump into Illustrator, we start to realize how many lines we have and maybe even some of the mistakes or some lines that we just don't need, right? So for instance, I forgot to wire cut that piece out, but thankfully I can ungroup it. And really, I guess I should do this for the whole drawing. But now I'm gonna basically treat this as a regular, as if I drew it, right, in two dimensions, right? So in my case, I can make my 11 by 17 and voila, right? You know, we're starting to have the ability to take this into Illustrator and, and make it into a line drawing. However, there's a little bit more that we wanna get, right? I mean, after all, we wanna get the shade and shadow and, and make that easier too. Is there any way we can just calculate the shade and shadow? Why, yes. Yes, there is, right? However, it'll become important to have this particular view, right? Because, well, if I click on this view, it's not going to match the shadows. And in fact, it might not match at all because I accidentally moved my object. So let's go ahead and move that back real quick, just so I don't have to stop myself from doing more work. But I'll need the exact viewport. So again, it'll be crucial to save this on your model of whatever view that you decide to do, right? And don't accidentally move it because that will, of course, cause this next part not to work. So in my case, I set up that view. Um, I guess I gotta make 2D again, which is unfortunate, but not a big deal. I'll still get this stuff out of the way first, right? So learn from my stakes. It's like going into the past, right? Oh, don't want that view. We'll go back to my top. And if you accidentally ever do that, you can just go to set view and back to your top view. But I definitely wanna make sure that I get this just right. Because again, I'm going to line them up with each other. So I need them. So make 2D. Luckily, it's not a very intensive model, so it produces pretty quick. And there it is. And now the important part is, of course, getting the shade and shadow. So I'll want to be in a rendered view for this one. And you probably won't want a black background like myself if you're trying to project shadow onto the background. So uh, one of the first things I'll do immediately is, of course, change my ambient light to black to white. Oh, wrong one. Change that back. Scratch that. Obviously, we want the, the shade and shadow quality of it. Um, however, I changed my background. And unfortunately, I can't really see the screen too well, as you guys know. There we go. Background, obviously not black. Let's go with something more like a soft gray. Arguably, you could even go with white, but it's almost too much. You almost can't like see the object. Again, I can always make this a gradient or even cooler. Uh, however, it is demanding on the computer. You can use a studio environment, which is kind of nice. It's more like a, a light room, so that's pretty cool. Uh, and very useful in terms of making our shadows, as you can see, that are being drawn and casted on the ground. The next thing that we could do is type in sun. I know it's just that simple. But it's really just going to bring up this little, uh, especially on the Mac, it's just going to bring it up as the tab. I think it actually pops up as a separate window for Windows. Um, but what's really nice here is we can manually control the shadows. How freaking cool is that? However, you know exactly what it takes to do that, right? Especially in analog and how much we have to sort of water it down in order to, to do some of these things. However, we do not have to water down much, right? We can, we can literally control the direction of where the shadow is coming from. Also, it's never a good idea, and you could talk to any photographer, they never take a picture in the shadow of the object. Why? Because you can't see the object. It's in the shadow, right? So more than often, it's a good idea to have your sun either coming from the left side or the right side, never from the back and arguably never from the front either because then you don't see that shadow, right? So again, there's a reason why we always put the sun to the left or the right. And more than often, if you're studying your site analysis correctly, we usually put the front or back of a building facing north or south, right? Well, maybe not south. But anyway, that's a different story. Uh, but the point of the matter is we can, of course, move um, every single bit of our sun. And we can even control the intensity of it. Right? And as you can see, it really just does more to the object, not so much to the shadow. And of course, you'll need to make sure that manual control is enabled. Right? Some of us know that if the sun is closer to the horizon, it, you know, it starts to get a little more yellow, right? You know, it's, it's almost like sunset, and we have our really long shadows. 
and those are of course important. Now I don't really want to go over rendering so most of the time I usually just take a screenshot. All right, I'll just take that piece and get it within reason because really all I need is the shadows. Right, keep that in mind. I don't need this this render. I'm not going to use it. I'm not going to Photoshop it. And in fact, it's got a bunch of stuff in it that I don't need. But what I do want it for is, well, I need to know if some of these things that I'm making are casting shadows. Right? How nice that would have been to have in you know some of our other assignments. Um, but as you can see, it even starts to cast on the object itself. So I want to make that a little bit more apparent. In our case, it's going to take. Um, some advanced settings. So I'll go to Rhino settings. And it ends up being in our display modes. And of course in our rendered mode. We can of course change the, the shade and shadow quality. Right, so we can go to objects. And, oh, sorry. It's been moved to actually its own category. So shadows. Of course, um, if you're not seeing any shadows, this is a really good uh, thing to check, is of course your preferences. Now on the windows, it's a little different. You'll still hit uh, preferences or settings, and it'll basically bring up a very similar window. However, some of this is in a different order. Again, I don't know why. Maybe the same person isn't making the Mac version as the Windows version, which would be insane, but I guess that might be the case. But again, what's nice here is I can really control and dial in uh, some of the stuff uh, so for instance the shadow intensity and usually um, it does it in real time as well so shadow intensity pretty good transparency of objects um, self shadowing artifacts uh, edge blurring usually I don't put any edge blur and in my case I want to use sharper shadows now look how it's kind of going slower it is definitely going to use some processing and I would definitely recommend doing this maybe on the desktop computers as it should give you less uh, of an issue and I'm going to go with quality so you guys can see and it's kind of doing it in real time blurring doesn't even want to move today Oh, definitely don't want to go in that direction. But I definitely want edge quality just because I'm going to end up tracing this. So it makes a lot more sense to make it easier for myself and make it a little bit more high in contrast. But as you can see, it really demands, and it could be the background of my thing, and also screen recording, so usually it's not this slow even for my computer, so hopefully it shouldn't be too bad for your own. But yeah, there's definitely the shadow ability there. However, don't get me wrong, some people's computer, they have different graphics cards, and so I do want to give you one more solution, just in case your sun command doesn't work. Also, if you have Rhino 6, the sun command is a little different, so just in case you're using the desktop computer. There is another way. I'm going to go ahead and turn off the sun. How weird is that? I'm going to go ahead and change my background so that this is a little easier to work with. So instead of studio or 36 environment, I just want to go to a solid color again and select maybe like that white background. It's going to be a little easier on my computer and arguably even show the shadows a little bit more in this case. But what I want to do is actually a spotlight. Because funny enough, it does the exact same thing as the sun. However, I do have to do this a little bit more manually. So in my case, I have to make the, the cone of the shape first and in a way choose the direction. Right? So I kind of have to set it up. But as you can see, it's, it's really the same thing and actually what we used to do before the sun tool because there wasn't always a sun tool. How weird is that? Um, we used to just kind of sit here and do it by hand. So you take this point and you'll see as I move it's really going to struggle on this one, especially if I'm doing it in real time. You can kind of start to see it, that shadow is definitely moving across the ground, but not really in a particularly uh, accurate way, right? However, for what we're doing, um, absolutely fine. If you have to use a, a spotlight, not the end of the world. Uh, in fact, sometimes I prefer it just because of how easy it is and how strong usually the shadow is. Um, but the reason I bring this up is because, to be honest, uh, most computers, um, 
if they're a little older, it, it really struggles with the render view, right? Uh, but that's looking pretty good, right? That's definitely ability to trace. I can start to see it on the object a little bit more. And great. Uh, that's going to be a cluster cuss, but yeah, right? I've, I've definitely got enough there so I can start tracing it. And I'll go ahead and take a screenshot of that. Right, just again for the sake of tutorial today. So I'm going to go ahead and take that off rendered view. And really all I got to work with now is, is this guy. Of course I need my rectangle, my 11 by 17. Start setting up my drawing. And in my case I'm going to take my picture. Enter. And I want to get that exact shot in there. Right. Oh, and there's my daughter. I don't want to trace her. Let's get the correct picture. Pretty sure it went to my desktop. Yeah, bless you. There we go, that's looking a lot better. So obviously, if that camera is a little off, guys, when I took that screenshot, it is never, and I mean never, going to line up, right? You'll spend hours upon hours trying to line up your lines to an image, and you'll be like, why is it not aligning? And it's because, well, you may have accidentally moved the camera a little bit. So again, make sure that you save that camera view and double click on it before you make 2D or before you take a screenshot. Again, that's super important. Now, we'll find out if I did or didn't. But the next thing I need to do is, of course, hold shift so that it always stays proportional because, my goodness, it also won't line up if I accidentally um, unproportion the image. But very often than not, I'll try to line up one piece and kind of just see where it's at right I mean that's starting to look pretty good um, I mean I've had some practice so dang am I good anyway obviously I think it's a little off I'm gonna go a little bit shorter eh, it's getting pretty close it's definitely enough to start tracing right so I'd want to make myself a new layer and by golly I'll call it shadows oh I guess I already have a shadow layer Shadows 2, or we'll just go to our original Shadows layer. All right. Obviously from here, there's a, there is a couple more things I can do to make this a little easier. I can click on the image and of course lock it. I would definitely, um, you know, before you trace anything, of course lock it. Um, but we can also change the transparency of the object. So once you click on the object, you'll see that under your properties, and we need to get to properties, you'll see this like little paint tube right so of course when you click on that paint tube it takes a little while to load but you can give um, the object that you have selected some transparency I like to do that before I hide it or lock it sorry uh, just because again I want to see my lines and sometimes like you know these hidden lines it can get pretty intense so um, that's looking pretty good and I'm gonna just lock it all right I mean I don't want it to really accidentally lock onto something else I'm going to use a polyline just because, well, most shadows are closed. And I'm going to start going. What's kind of nice is as long as I have my Make 2D lines there, I can really use them to trace some shadow. Now I'm going to fake it till I make it. I mean, I'm not going to get too fancy. I, I kind of want that human error. So, not too bad. But as you can see, a screenshot does just fine in terms of having to put the shadows on here. I will say, if you're doing a three-dimensional model, the shadows are required, right? However, if you're doing a two-dimensional drawing, you do not have to calculate the shadows. If you want to, absolutely abs um, extra credit. However, um, it's really more of a requirement for the A-team, as I was mentioning the other day. So this is where I would trace my shadow, and for the sake of conversation and speed, I'll just kind of fake it till I make it real quick. Uh, da, da, and there, and there. Right, not a big deal. I like to close mine just in case, you know, I do want to hatch them, and in this case I do. So I like to close that piece. That way I can just hatch it really easily. Click on the inside, press enter, boom. I've already got lines. I'm already saving hours of time, right, to, to argue the least. Um, but of course from here, I don't really want the image for my Illustrator drawing. I really just want it to be an all-line drawing, right? So don't get me wrong, 
eventually I'm gonna have to delete this piece because well shadows don't have outlines so I mean don't get me wrong I don't have to delete it I could also make it white in Illustrator nobody would ever know um, that it matches the background All right so I mean there's that option too but just because I wanted to show you how um, how great and non-forgiving this this task is so I'm gonna go ahead and unlock it and I want to go ahead and put it into Illustrator. Now, I'm not, I, I'm not really done, right? Um, you know, if I had a little bit more time, I would, I would explain this is definitely where you can fix the drawing, right? I don't have to keep actually any of these lines. Um, in fact, some of them, they're even grouped. So, I mean, it's showing up in the render. But um, I don't necessarily have to take these lines even um, into Illustrator. So I can ungroup them, obviously. I'd even probably want to ungroup them all at the same time. But I can go in here and of course delete the lines because deleting lines one at a time in Illustrator is pain and you don't want to waste your time. Your time is valuable, right? Obviously, I don't even need my surface anymore, to be fair. And most of the stuff, it looks like I can kind of get rid of it, right? It's going to be stuck inside the drawing or I'm going to be like, oh no, I need to fix the drawing, right? So don't get me wrong, your two-dimensional tools will still come in handy. Oh, that's kind of neat. Obviously, I want more of a zero situation. I'm going to go with zero. Zero radius is, of course, just a rectilinear angle. All right, so we're already fixing our drawing. And again, arguably, this is even faster than, say, fixing a model. Right? But yeah, much better, much easier to read. Honestly, I'm wondering what that... Oh, it's a grid line. Gotcha. But yeah, this is definitely the part of the drawing that you want to fix it here before you go into Illustrator. However, let's imagine that I did fix it all. It's all ready to go. I've got my shadow traced, what have you, right? In fact, actually, I want that to be solid. I think solid looks better. Of course, I could double click on it, usually. Did I lock it? No? What's going on here? There we go. Sweet, now we're getting somewhere. Obviously I should have got all the shadows, but let's go ahead and take it into Illustrator just so we can see what it does to the hidden lines. And what I was trying to explain last time, right? Like you can do hidden lines, but you no matter what have to change their scale. So test part three, put it on our desktop. Sweet. And let's go ahead and take a look at Illustrator. Aw oh, man, I forgot to open it before class. That's okay. Are we still recording? Thank goodness. Sometimes it'll just cut off for no reason. So it's been a good week. A couple weeks, actually. Come on, Illustrator. My Illustrator definitely is quite demanding. Um, it's a slightly older version. Just because I didn't want to pay for the new one. The old one still works, I think. Plus, I'm not a graphic designer. I just need line weights. Sweet. So I'm going to go ahead and open up um, that file that I exported. There it is. Actually, I, I didn't even see what I exported as, so I should probably check. But... Yep, and I had it in the wrong format. I'm going to use a DZWG just because it's, it's tried and true for me. So, test, part three. About seven minutes to spare. Come on, man. I always wonder why it does that. If you move it too fast on the Mac, it like gets really big to like be like, hey, I'm right here. Anyway, got our default export. Let's change some lines. And since the Make 2D automatically puts it in your visible layers, and it even, if you actually check maintain layers, so that was one thing I forgot to cover, during your Make 2D, there is an option to maintain layers. This can be really important, especially if you have everything layered, right? And crucial because it will flatten it into one layer, right? And that's no good for Illustrator. So there's our test part three. Go ahead and open that up. In my case, I'm just gonna scale it to fit the artboard real quick. when it opens there we go so scale to fit artboard 
and we should get a couple of lines. Now in our case, uh, looks like it's maybe really, 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 really small. That's okay. I think it's actually quite adorable. But let's go ahead and stretch that out. I'm going to hold shift. Again, for the sake of time, we'll just leave it, you know, something like that. And for the sake of my computer not wanting to explode, let's go ahead and save this so I can close it. Sweet. And hopefully get back some of my graphic card. Come on, lines. Has anybody been testing their patience with Illustrator? Just wait until you get a drawing that has 6,000 lines and you're like, come on. <laughs> Again, there's no shame, guys, in using a desktop computer. You'll notice that even it'll outbeat even the best laptop because like I was saying in previous courses, the laptop was never designed for actual computer work. It was designed for portability, right? It was designed for Excel and Word and uh, looking at photos and music and, and things like that, arguably even still to this day. Um, it, there's just more power in a desktop. It's plugged into the wall, right? Just like your laptop will run a little bit better if it's plugged into the wall, right? It's running at a different voltage. However, that's looking good. All right, we got some lines in there. But again, all I really wanted to show is that you have the ability to, of course, change your shadow layer. And it looks like maybe I didn't put it on the right layer. Yeah, Illustrator's just going really slow for this screen record. If it's going to be this long, I might just, sh you know, go with the line work, but I got a feeling it's a screen record. It does take quite a bit. Might just be time for a new computer. Mine is getting on seven years old, so I am pushing it even by my own rule. But yeah, uh, Illustrator can be unforgiving. Well, anyway, we'll, we'll take it on. Obviously, this won't be our last tutorial continuing this conversation. But hopefully this is enough to obviously continue with that one point. If you know, you've already mastered the two point, you've already figured out your whole piece. Now it might be kind of time to try and figure out how do you want to show the outside or show the inside of your object. Some of you guys have a very enclosed space. It might be a good idea to see sort of outside a window or something. Whereas some of you guys may have like a big entry, maybe it shows a stair at the beginning and we can kind of see the whole thing going up uh, for your one point perspective. So again, um, test the waters. Obviously if you make a digital model, you should be kind of flying around this whole thing. Maybe getting a couple of shots so that you can actually choose from. And that would be a great thing to print out on Monday. Right. Hey, I want to get uh, some feedback on some of the, the drama or the, the communication of these perspectives. So, well, now that it's finally loaded uh, and I zoomed out, oh well. Looks like it's slowing down today, probably because I have a lot of grouped objects. Another good rule of thumb is to always ungroup your objects before going into Illustrator. Sometimes that can help. Um, I have a feeling it's just my computer. So, Oh, and I do have 2024 now. That might be the issue too. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and end it here for today unless there are particular questions that I haven't answered yet. Anybody got any? Yes, sir. Oh, for exercise five? Yeah, get with me after. No questions about this part of the assignment, guys? Hopefully. Um, doing just well? Man, it took all that time just to zoom out. Um, and I have a feeling it's actually a, something to do with this hatch for some reason. That, that really made it struggle. Uh, but again, you'll see that you have visible curves and you have hidden curves. So again, really useful tool. So just to kind of show you real quick, um, if you click on the stroke and you click on dash line, you can really dial in and of course control based on the points itself. And again, just arguably easier than Rhino. Just like that, I changed every single line. Right, so let me zoom in a little bit. Yeah, and there you go. Starting to get a nice, healthy dash. 
Um, I'd probably make it a lot lighter than that. So, super light, and would probably even go thinner on it. For some reason, it's going pretty fast now. Hopefully, it's still recording. But yeah, as you can see, my goodness, can you imagine how long this would take you to draft, right? And now you have the ability to make three of them literally within the same time as one of them by analog. So again, like a thousand, two thousand percent increase of our time. Um, so hopefully you're already starting to reap the benefits of these programs, right? To say the least. Anyway, no questions? Glad I got to go to the later, but we'll continue of course next week.